A deep sea diver's umbilical is severed 300 feet below in the North Sea, cutting off his breathing gas and communications. Stranded in total darkness in just minutes to survive, his crew assumed he was gone forever. This terrifying true story has been adapted into the film Last Breath, starring Woody Harrelson, Simu Lee, and Finn Cole. As a commercial diver for the last 13 years, I want to break this incredible story down from a diver's perspective. Now before we dive into this incredible survival story, we need to peel back the layers of saturation diving with a quick physics lesson. I promise to keep this simple, but it will make the rest of the story much easier to understand. Saturation, or sat divers for short, are an elite group. In the commercial diving world, they're the rock stars who make all the money and get all the glory, but their jobs come with increased risk and isolation from the outside world. Their deep sea work, traditional scuba or commercial diving is just simply not an option. When we breathe at the surface, our lungs absorb air, which is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. At depth, however, the increased pressure makes the nitrogen molecules smaller, causing the nitrogen to dissolve into our body's tissues. Now, the longer that divers stay down, the more nitrogen our bodies absorb. And if we ascend too quickly, that nitrogen will expand too fast. This will form bubbles inside our tissues and bloodstream, just like opening a shaken can of Coke. This leads to decompression sickness, most commonly known as the bends, which can cause excruciating pain, paralysis, or even death. To prevent this, divers ascend back to the surface, slowly allowing the nitrogen to leave their bodies the same way that we brought it in, through exhaling. So on the way down, we're breathing in all of that compressed gas, it's saturating our body's tissues, and then on the way up during our slow ascent, we are exhaling, getting rid of all that excess nitrogen out of our tissues. Now, in extreme depths, in this case 300 feet, there are two major changes that have to be made to the breathing gas. At 300 feet, the 79% nitrogen in regular air would be narcotic. This would impair our judgment, coordination, and even become deadly. This is known as Martini's Law. So to prevent this, nitrogen is replaced with helium, creating what is called a heliox gas mixture. This is what the saturation divers breathe. Now the second challenge, also at 300 feet, the 21% of oxygen that supports life here on Earth is also deadly. At that depth, divers would suffer from O2 toxicity, experiencing full body convulsions, seizures, and permanent brain damage. Remember, these higher pressures at depth are giving us a higher concentration of those gases. So the second thing we have to do is reduce the percentage of oxygen to 14%. This creates a 1486 heliox mixture. Now, heliox has a few downsides. First and the most obvious is what we like to call the Donald Duck voice. Hey, what's happening? What's happening? <coughs> what's happening? Yeah, well, we need to, uh, to keep coming up on it. Okay, uh, diver one, are you, are you, are you hurt your toe, Roger? <laughs> okay, did you get your toe in that clamp? Helium is a lighter gas and it makes it difficult to understand the divers. The second is that helium is a fantastic thermal conductor. Unfortunately, when divers exhale their gas, it rapidly expels heat from their bodies. So to prevent hypothermia, divers wear hot water suits and have hot water pumped down to them from the ship. It's a wonderful feeling and it's like swimming in a jacuzzi. Third, heliox is a very expensive gas, so they use what is called a reclaim system. So this helmet behind me is a Kirby Morgan 97. This is pretty much the same helmet that they use in saturation diving, except for one major difference. When I breathe out, that exhaled gas just goes right out the side of this helmet into the water. Sat divers have a pod in front of the helmet that takes the exhaled gas, routes it through a hose, back up to the dive bell, and then back up to the ship. When the exhaled gas reaches the ship, the CO2 is scrubbed out and oxygen is added back in. This gas is now ready to breathe, so it's stored in cylinders on the ship and then sent back to the dive bell as needed. Now, even though we made these two changes, the rules of decompression still apply. 
if we look at this dive table from the United States Navy, after just 40 minutes on Heliox at 300 feet, we would have 371 minutes of decompression, over six hours of decompression after just 40 minutes of bottom time. As you can imagine, this is not very efficient, nor is it safe. So instead of making divers decompress after every shift, the sand divers live in a pressurized habitat on board the deck of the ship. This is where the crew eats, sleeps, showers, and uses the toilet. The divers are monitored by both audio and video in every room. There is zero privacy. Now to be clear, the habitat is on the ship. It is never submerged. Wow, this is my living chamber. The pressure inside the habitat is the same pressure of whatever project they are working on. This is what is called storage depth. This means that they can dive, return to the chamber, and sleep all without having to undergo decompression. Now the cool thing about saturation diving is after about 24 hours at storage depth, the diver's tissues become fully saturated. So whether they stay at 300 feet of pressure for two days or 20 days, they will spend the same amount of time decompressing. The decompression time doesn't increase. That's where the name saturation diver comes from. The only time that they decompress is at the end of their 28 day mission where they will spend up to a week slowly returning to surface pressure inside of the chamber. As you can imagine, this is a very costly operation where every minute counts. So these dive support vessels will have multiple dive crews working around the clock. In the case of the 350 foot Bibby Topaz, there are four separate living chambers for four separate dive crews. Each dive crew has three men and they rotate shifts working six hours each. In dive team one, Woody Harrelson plays the role of Bellman Duncan Alcock, who tends and supports the divers during their shift. Simu Lee plays diver Dave Yuasa and Finn Cole as the other diver, Chris Lemons. When it's time to begin their work shift, there is a dive bell that mates to the living habitat. Once they ensure the pressure in the bell and the living habitat are the same, they can open the door, climb into the dive bell, seal the door shut, and then are lowered through a moon pool down to the seafloor. Think of the dive bell as simply the diver's elevator and how they get to work each day. Now the ship will already have a large clump weight at working depth, lowered by a cable system through the moon pool. These cables serve as guides for the dive bell to keep its orientation and so that it doesn't spin out of control. The clump weight is always positioned below the dive bell to eliminate any pendulum swing. Once the divers reach their work site, the storage depth will be the same as the actual working depth. The divers can now open the hatch at the bottom of the bell, climb through, and begin their shift. Now the divers are connected to the bell by 50 meter or 150 foot long umbilicals. This is a group of hoses and cables which supplies the divers with their main breathing gas hose, their hot water hose, cables for light and a live feed camera, reclaim gas hose, and it also includes a secondary breathing hose called a pneumo. It gets this name because it's connected to a pneumo fathometer gauge, aka an air depth gauge. In an emergency, we're actually trained to breathe off of this hose and use it to supply an unconscious diver with an immediate breathing supply. Staying behind in the dive bell is Bellman Duncan Alcock. He monitors the gas, tends the divers' hoses, helps get them in and out of their dive gear, and is there to respond in an emergency. The divers' lives are in his hands. Joining the dive team is an ROV. It's sort of like an underwater drone controlled by a pilot back on the ship. This ROV provides video back to dive control and keeps a close watch on the divers. Also back on the ship is the diving supervisor. Like the dive crews, there are multiple dive soups, and they work around the clock on rotating shifts. The dive soups are in the control room, monitoring the dive team through live video and voice communications and lead the diving operations. And when the divers are in the water, they have total control over the entire ship. 
Both divers wear a load rated safety harness with bailout bottles on their backs. These are the size of two standard scuba bottles, which is enough gas to make it back to the bell if there was an emergency. If they need to use the gas, they open this valve right here and they are now breathing on bailout. Now speaking of helmets, one interesting side note is this helmet right here is 95% of the helmets that you will see in the industry. This is a Kirby Morgan dive helmet. Now in the movie, they use a new helmet called a Drass D1. I assume it's due to that helmet having a larger face port, which makes it better for filming. They also added some lights inside of the helmet and removed the oral nasal pocket, which would otherwise muffle the diver's audio and you wouldn't be able to see their faces as clearly. Today, their dive crew is working on a manifold template, which is a 33 foot or 10 meter tall structure on the bottom of the seabed. It's used to distribute oil and gas from their wellheads to the production pipelines. These manifolds are typically about 50 feet wide. So you're probably wondering how this 350 foot vessel can stay over such a small target in the middle of the North Sea for days. Well, the Topaz uses a dynamic positioning system, which essentially means it has a number of thrusters that are used to hold a precise location. In this case, they are holding position directly over the manifold template to be as close to the worksite as possible. Now, the DPS has a traffic light style warning system. Green means all systems are good. Amber means we've lost a thruster or power to something, but it's not a huge concern it occasionally happens from time to time. In red, well, red means just hit the fan. So the dive team starts their dive at 8.45 p.m. Now the divers have to work inside of this manifold structure, which when you're inside of it, it just more or less a large group of pipes with a flat grating on top. Just 20 minutes into their dive, Chris and Dave hear an unsettling message. Dive team one, this is an all stop. Drop what you're doing and get back to the bell now. Umbilical management is something that commercial divers are always conscious of because at any time we can easily get tangled on an object. Now Chris and Dave begin climbing to the top of the structure, but Chris realizes he has a small loop hooked around a pipe. The vessel begins drifting hundreds of feet in a matter of seconds, pulling Chris's umbilical in so quickly that he doesn't have enough slack to free himself. The tension his umbilical is under grows greater as Chris is getting pulled in closer to the pipe. Back inside the bell, Duncan is giving Chris as much slack as he can, but eventually he runs out. The bell is now sitting at a 45 degree angle as Chris quite literally becomes the anchor for the 350 foot, 8,000 ton topaz. Keep in mind with the hatch open at the bottom, this dive bell is now an air bubble about to spill over and flood with water. Chris, get back to the bell now. Meanwhile, diver Dave was getting dragged off the platform and across the seafloor. He's trying to get back to the bell, but he can't keep up with the drifting ship. At approximately 10.13 p.m., back at the manifold, Chris's umbilical is stretching into such a small diameter that it's like trying to breathe through a straw. Chris turns on his EGS valve to breathe from his bailout bottles on his back. His umbilical snaps, and it's like hearing a loud gunshot go off. Chris is thrown from the structure and lands on the seafloor below. With no hot water, he has just minutes before hypothermia sets in. With no lights to see with, he is lost and disoriented. With no communications back to the surface, they have no clue if he is alive. Chris is now alone at 300 feet with just 10 minutes of breathing gas. Meanwhile, the crew on board the Topaz were struggling to get the DPS system back online. The DPS has triple redundancy, so there's a main system, there's a backup system, and then there's another backup system. All three systems had failed, which is an ultra rare occurrence. In the meantime, the vessel has now drifted 240 meters, nearly 800 feet off position. So the captain and first officer are going full speed ahead, trying to manually regain control of the thrusters to get the ship back on top of the manifold so they can recover Chris's body. This is far easier said than done. This is a specialized system fine-tuned by computer programs. It takes all four of their hands to try and hold position controlling the thrusters. After about 20 minutes of failed attempts to get the system back online, the crew makes one last ditch effort to shut the system down completely and restart it. Now this decision is a double-edged sword because they could lose power to their thrusters completely, leaving them sitting ducks in the middle of a storm in the North Sea. But if they don't try, then Chris is for sure dead. 
they successfully reboot the DPS, get positioned above the manifold, and then send the ROV down to search for Chris. During this time, they are still inching the topaz closer to the manifold. They don't know what to expect or where Chris is, so it's crucial that they get the dive bell directly over the manifold so that Dave can make a speedy search and recovery. Dave and Duncan stand by with anticipation as they wait for the green light from the diving supervisor. The ROV finally reaches the structure miraculously, laying on top of the manifold is Chris. He appears to be unconscious, although waving at the shining light from the ROV as to say, I'm still here. They manage to get the dive bell close to the manifold, and Dave is sent out to recover the 6 foot 4, 200 pound Chris with 100 pounds of gear on his back. By the time that Dave reaches Chris, he has lost consciousness. After nearly 40 minutes since his umbilical snapped, Chris was finally inside the bell. They remove his helmet and his face is as blue as a pair of denim jeans. Bellman Duncan gives two mouth-to-mouth -mouth breaths and Chris immediately begins to breathe. They begin watering him down with hot water from his ruptured umbilical. They shut the bell closed and begin making their way back to the chamber on the ship. Chris's vital signs were stable after just 18 minutes. By midnight, all three men climbed out of the dive bell into the chamber and continued caring for Chris, wrapping him up with blankets until his body temperature recovered. At 8 a.m. the next morning, decompression began for all 12 sat divers. By the time they arrived back into port in Aberdeen, Scotland, on September 22nd, they had all completed their decompression. Remarkably, the final examinations at Capita Health Center in Aberdeen revealed zero neurological injury. They made this sat diver take an SAT test. Part of me kind of wonders if this was just some sort of sick joke, but he passed with no difficulties. Three weeks later, Chris was back on another dive mission after just being married. His wife said she did not want to talk him out of his dream profession. Now, we don't know exactly how Chris managed to survive for roughly 30 minutes with no breathing supply. The best explanation I could find was in this fascinating research paper. Now, they really dive into the science and just how exactly it was possible for Chris to survive this incident unscathed. Now, if you want me to do a deep dive into that, let me know in the comments but I'll leave a link below if you guys would like to look at it on your own. So in this paper, they state that on the surface, it appears to be a miracle, but if you peel back the layers, there are a few factors that benefited Chris's favor. Firstly, it was widely reported that Chris only had five minutes of breathing gas. At a depth of 90 meters or 300 feet, the actual time, assuming the bailout bottles are full, is actually closer to 13 minutes. And even 22 minutes after his umbilical severed, he was seen waving at the ROV. Now, when victims experience hypothermia, everything in their bodies slows down and it goes into a preservation mode. That's why there's a saying, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. Three minutes after waving at the ROV, he was unconscious due to hypothermia. Their theory is, while unconscious, his breathing slowed to nearly an undetectable amount. So he may have never truly had a gap in his breathing supply. Next, they claim that even if the breathing gas only lasted five minutes, there was enough oxygen saturated in Chris's body that would have been sufficient for survival. Fourth, at the time of Chris's rescue, his body temperature was calculated to be about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. This is normally fatal, but in Chris's case, the cold may have preserved him just long enough. Lastly, they state that helium in the biological tissues exerts neuroprotective properties, which protected Chris's brain from any sort of brain damage. They claim that this is not a miracle, but something that can be explained by science. I don't know about you guys, but for the ship to break free in a storm, the captain, the dive supervisor, ROV pilot, and his dive team all work together to recover a diver at the bottom of the North Sea in frigid waters, bring him back to life, is truly a miracle to me. The professionalism of the entire crew on board is something that should be applauded and is a testament to the safety and training that we endure as divers. This was truly a one-off incident. There was an investigation into the DPS system that went offline. Chris said they tried to recreate the system failure like an insane number of times, like a million times or something, and they were unable to recreate it. Now, since Chris's incident, there have been some improved safety measures in sat diving. The biggest one is that they no longer solely rely on bailout bottles as a backup breathing supply. They now wear rebreathers connected to their helmets, which is similar to the ones that scuba divers wear. The rebreather works in tandem with the bailout bottles, so just like the main reclaim system that we talked about, it recycles the gas and helps the divers get around 45 minutes out of those bailout bottles instead of just 10. They now also include lights on the umbilicals, making separated divers easier to locate. 
This was one of the most incredible survival stories in diving history, and I'm so glad that the world would get to learn about some of the challenges that we face as commercial divers. So if you haven't already, go support this film, watch it, rent it. You guys are going to love it. Again, thanks as always, and dive safe.